This is the Fiat G91. I really like this aircraft, not just because I've been inside one. So comfortable, you wouldn't believe it. Probably one of the most comfortable planes I've ever sat in. What Fiat did with this plane made it the most notable and forgotten attempt to standardize NATO around one aircraft. Let's talk about this failure. And in the background, we will also have some visual representations of the G91 from Warfunder, today's sponsor. To get us started, fast rewind. So now we have... Into the 1950s, NATO came up with NBMR-1, NATO Basic Military Requirement 1, to have one aircraft be the standard lightweight tactical strike fighter that all the main countries of the alliance would use. So that includes France, Britain, West Germany, Italy, potentially even the United States of America. They should all standardize on it. Why? Well, if everyone flies the same, you've got economies of scale in terms of production, you've got interoperability when it comes to the actual air forces, uh, you've got benefits for maintenance and logistics and so on. With the competition starting in 1953-54, France entered with the Brigetton, Britain with the Follen Gnand, or however you pronounce that thing, it's British after all, we just don't know. Follen Gnand. And Italy, of course, entered with the Fiat G91. Now, I'm gonna put my bias out there immediately because I think Fiat should be commended with really truly embracing the concept that NATO proposed. A simple, cheap, no-nonsense machine able to be flown from the most rudimentary air straps with maintenance crews that had minimal training. What you're looking at here is essentially the Saab Gripen of the 1950s. Fiat at this point had already been servicing most F-86 Sabres in service in NATO air forces in Europe. And the G91 similarity to that aircraft, it makes absolutely sense. It was what one publication phrased as a non-identical aerodynamic twin of the Sabre. Yes, Fiat built something like the Sabre. It was a proven concept in need of some upgrades. Instead of going proprietary, Fiat went shopping to standardize around on-the-shelf equipment. A French landing gear, US-style rivets, ball threads and skin gauges, a British engine, the NATO fighter was coming together. Fiat even adopted North American aviation-style sign-off sheets for inspectors, moved away from the very traditional, artisanal, Italian handmade crafting to milled and pressed parts that can be pumped out in high numbers with very good results in terms of economics of scale and cooperated with NACA on improving the performance of the aircraft. The Fiat G91 was a serious attempt to standardize. The operational use of the Fiat G91 was conceptualized around a very basic framework, that being high sortie outputs. I'll show that off with some Warfunder footage in the background. Operating from dispersed field strips, even grass strips, it would take off with a small but significant enough bomb load. It would cruise to the target at low altitude, usually in a small formation of two or four ship, go to full speed, locate whatever needed to disappear, drop the ordnance in one pass and hightail it back to the field immediately. It was never supposed to loiter for more than a few minutes over enemy held territory. It was go in fast, subsonic though, but go in fast, drop bombs and then run away to do the same thing again. And once it has landed at the airstrip, there will be easy access to all the plane's panels for some quick maintenance and superficial inspection. Perhaps there are some light repairs that can be done. And then of course you have a very quick refueling and rearming process and the plane was ready again. The Fiat G91 was the jet equivalent of what for example a World War II German Luftwaffe would have called a Schlachtflieger, a close air support aircraft operating with rolling sorties and high intensity engagements. The concept, albeit as a jet, is essentially the same. It's a simple, reasonably fast, reasonably maneuverable aircraft operating from austere runways close to the front line. It is not an Italian stallion, it is a workhorse. Albeit with an exceptionally good cockpit. So comfortable, you wouldn't believe it. In 1958, Fiat won the competition against four concepts presented by France. A compromise was then also worked out. Fiat gets the victory with the G91 
and France will get the second generation NATO standardized stride fighter, which was supposed to be then the Etendard 6 or the Town. Everyone agreed that the G91 was an excellent aircraft for its type and that within the spirit of the competition, it was a solid choice with a projected price tag of about $2.5 million per aircraft adjusted for today's inflation. The Fiat G91 was a cheap option, cheaper than the Sabre. Mind you, I don't know if that is pure flyaway cost or what order volume this is based on, so take that figure of course with a grain of salt, but what I want to say is it was a cheap aircraft for the time. As always, quoted aircraft costs are notoriously unreliable, as I've already talked about in my F-35 video. So that all sounds good, but then the problem started. No one really wants the aircraft. The initial French-Italian-West German negotiation over 150 aircraft was there, but everyone was a bit hesitant about this aircraft. The likely reasons for this hesitance I will go into it in just a second. But anyway, 150 aircraft for a standardized short-range strike fighter with a reasonably, let's be honest, reasonably high attrition rate should the Cold War go hot. It's just not a fleet to speed off, even if it was just the first order. There was a reasonable chance for follow-up orders once the plane was introduced, but at the same time, the clock was ticking. More on that also in just a second. Yeah, cliffhanger. Interest by nations such as Austria, Greece, Switzerland, the United States and Turkey did not yield any contracts or fulfill contracts. Even France pulls out, potentially as it feared that their second generation deal was threatened by competition. A fear that was well founded, mind you. Both Britain and West Germany started to push for veto concepts in strike fighters. West Germany eventually jumps in with a sizable order of 200 Fiat G91s with 150 built on the license. In the end, only West Germany and Italy adopt the plane as original users and the eventual production run of 700 plus machines isn't actually half bad. Possible also goes on to adopt a couple of licensed productions from Germany using them in their colonial wars, but a standardized NATO strike fighter, it was not. Why did no one want the Fiat G91? Well, there are multiple reasons that help explain this. The premise of adding G91 to the inventory was largely based around each country agreeing to accept the winner of the competition, even if it wasn't their own design. With the United Kingdom losing interest, French support was based around the understanding that second generation standardization of a NATO strike fighter would be a French design. When this appeared more and more unlikely, the French pulled their support. And you can't really blame them. This shows the role that political and economic requirements play within defense procurement as even West Germany relied on their own license production as a prerequisite to the adoption of the aircraft. While NATO standardization appears reasonable on paper, the question remains whether the G91 fitted the military framework of each member country. For West Germany and Italy, as the front line should the Warsaw Pact launch an attack, the idea of a simple, low-cost, high sortie count light strike fighter operating in field conditions made sense. Perhaps World War II experience on the Eastern Front also added to this decision. For the other large members, like France, that was still in NATO at this point, and the United Kingdom, even though they of course had local deployments in West Germany, the G91 specifications looked a lot less well suited to the overall needs of the force, or at least were understood as such. Ultimately, the military value, or rather the appeal of the G91, can also be questioned around two axes. While they had yet to proliferate, the 1960s saw the introduction of more potent ground defenses. At the same time, the basic design of the G91 was based on a jet generation that started to be replaced. As a basic comparison, it won the contract in 1958, the same year the F-104 Starfighter had its first flight. It was a Korean War type plane in a jet world that went supersonic. That doesn't necessarily reduce its battlefield value, but certainly made it a tougher sale. 
But you know, you can be the judge of that because the Fiat G91 is one of thousands of vehicles that await you in War Thunder. If you want to have a true extravaganza of aircraft at your disposal from World War II all the way to modern jets, War Thunder is what you need. And that includes of course the Fiat G91 in multiple variants. It's a cheerful little machine I had a lot of fun with recently, especially when you mess up your M-Class missile and then you do in fact clutch it right into the target. Yep, on your right buddy, on your right. Still on your right, yeah, still on your right, on your right. Oh dear. In War Thunder, you can even take the disguise in voodoo machines or in tanks and ships. Although, really, we air power aficionados should really refer to them by their proper title targets. If you want to just sit back, engage in tense dogfights, and blow off some steam, War Thunder offers all the options. I highly encourage you to check out the mixed battle arena where you can drive around in targets before upgrading your life experience with an aircraft and deliver some accurate close air support. War Thunder constantly adds new aircraft, voodoo machines and targets. You can play it on PC like a true connoisseur or you can join the fun via PlayStation and Xbox. It has full cross-platform integration meaning you can play with friends everywhere. Signing up is completely free so make sure to use my exclusive sign up bonus in the description. You'll be getting an absolutely fantastic selection of sign up bonuses from vehicles over to boosters and of course also an exclusive channel logo. It fits that in the end only Italy and West Germany took on the Fiat G91 with a NATO and thus kept the NATO strike fighter program alive for some time. The plane was similar enough to the existing Sabre fleet that these countries had, resembled the capabilities and the experience made with planes on the Eastern Front during the Second World War, and it had also a philosophy centered around very austere airfield and maintenance conditions that a frontline country like West Germany and indeed Italy might face compared to, let's say, the UK and France. And when Portugal eventually used it in combat, the plane also proved that it could do what it was designed to do. But once again, the Fiat G91 was one of those planes that wouldn't just have been a political concession on the side of many countries, but it came out just at a point when a generational shift occurred in aviation. And as we know from the past with so many other planes, these aircraft often end up being the ones that draw the short straw. Big thank you to all the channel supporters and Patreons. Make sure to also check your inboxes because early access videos are coming out regularly. And as always, I wish all of you a great day and see you in the sky.